Welcome, as we continue on this exploration of identity crisis. We're nearing the end of Black History Month and I thought that this video would be fitting. One of the number one things that we need to tackle first is Egypt and all its implications. This video is by no means an attempt to take anything away from anyone. It's simply an opportunity to present an alternative version of history that we've not been privy to. The only way to fight the separation and division that's happening right now is to come together and to discover more about ourselves. Let's have an open discussion. In the modern day, we have this concept of the African American. This concept that blacks were taken from Africa, brought to America, and that they were stripped from their homeland. This is believed by the majority of the modern population. If you were to suggest an alternative history from this, it would be seen as blasphemy. Now we're at the point that if you're an educator and you refuse to do the Wakanda salute, you'll be fired for being a racist. The only way we continue forward is by asking questions. There are many things that do not add up with our history, and we have to start with this concept of out of Africa. First, we must understand that there's only two cosmologies. The materialistic cosmology of nothing, the main cosmology of the modern day education system where they teach evolution and that man came from monkeys. Then there's the cosmology that is of ancient ancestry, the cosmology of something, the cosmology of a hierarchy of spiritual planes. We know these concepts such as the astral, etheric, and mental planes of existence. This idea that we came out of Africa is a concept that is connected to Darwin and evolution. It's a direct child of the cosmology of materialism. This is because they teach that all humans and races came from the missing link or the first human. They're basically teaching that humans evolved from monkeys out of Africa. This idea is a materialistic concept as it does not explain the origins of consciousness or spirit. It creates an identity crisis. The first level is a cosmological propaganda. The next level is racial propaganda. They don't want us to know our true history. If we knew how powerful we were in the past, the more difficult it is for the elite to control civilization. Now, if you're new to this, you might think that this is complete BS. I'd keep an open mind as there are many clues that hint to a history that has been entirely rewritten. But one of the many things that we can do is to take a look at some older manuscripts. This here is a map from, let's see, 1450. And we've used this map on other Tartarian videos and stuff because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here that doesn't seem to go with the official narrative. Um, we've brought up that there's a lot of big towers and architecture in Asia, in Tartaries on here as well. But what's interesting about this map is, well, first of all, it's upside down. So that's a little confusing. But there seems to be, or the majority of civilization is in the east, opposed to like here in Rome. There really isn't that much going on, or the buildings are much smaller. So what's going on with that? But the big point of this is, let's take a look at Africa. So if we move up to Africa, it's the same deal. We're seeing all these ginormous buildings and it seems like here's Egypt, right? But the point is, is that where are all these castles? And there are many maps, you know, from 500, 600 years ago that are depicting Africa as being much more populated than we're told. So, yeah, and if you look over here, I mean, what are these big towers? Castles. So, I want to give a shout out to Autodidactic and Martin Liedke. They really kind of put the stepping stones to really understanding a lot of this stuff. So, go check them out. They have a lot of these books and links and they kind of give their own opinions. But what we have right here is an illustration of some what seems to be some Moorish figures that are dressed in some very interesting clothing. And see, here he goes, Africa. So this is an African. This is what the Africans looked like 500 years ago. And there were dragons. And this is not the only book that depicts dragons and other strange creatures in this area. This is really strange, not only for the costumes, but it seems that they're depicting massive cities that 
just doesn't really go with the timeline. And so there's really a lot to look at, but let's just look at a couple. Um, this is Constantinople right here. Let's see. I mean, look at this. Look at these towers, domes. I mean, this looks like, honestly, something kind of futuristic. Let's see. This one's called Ormus. That's kind of weird. And again, big cities and skyscraper type buildings. But what's more interesting is that they have some African cities on here. Morocco, okay, let's click on this. And just massive cities in almost every single one of these. Here are some Moorish looking people and this medieval castle, big city that seems to be in the background and all these ships. You know, it's interesting because many of these show depictions of kind of like natives or, you know, they have some very basic gear, but then in the background, these big cities. So what's going on? This is a really interesting one, Arzilla. And many of these books show Africa with star forts in them, cities that are have walls all the way around them. This one's not obviously a star fort, but you're gonna see more that makes it much more clear. And then if you look over here, it, it looks like that there's these two towers, whether they're some kind of etherical technology or energy producing towers uh, but this seems a little bit out of place outside of the city wonder what they're for and then you have this thing on top of the cliff maybe some ritual ceremonial and i wasn't sure exactly what these cities were but i found another website that had a different map slightly different and basically these are views of the five northern and western african coastal towns on one sheet and supposedly they're from the 16th century but again that they want us to think i mean like what's going on here i mean what do you mean and then there's a star fort all around it um that's not right something does not line up with that story and it's i mean it's multiple cities this is this is something that was already there until the catholics came and tried to convert these people or whoever was left um, into Christianity. Okay, so let's look at some more African cities from the 1500s. Um, and this is more in the Mediterranean, so these are the islands near Africa. Um, but again, you have star fort cities. Entire cities that are barricaded, basically. Um, so yeah, this is on Gallica, and if you try to find another version of this map, um, these are these are old depictions of the mediterranean islands so were they just in the 1500s were they just sailing everywhere and just creating these massive um medieval looking cities and they did this all and like i mean how long did it take to do this so if we look at you know stuff like this and some of the older maps um it's very clear that these are just leftovers of a prior civilization okay so here's another old book kind of depicting Egypt and Africa from a couple hundred years ago. So let's just go ahead and open it up. This is what they're depicting Alexandria to look like. Okay, so there's a lot of things to take from this. One, there's basically, this is a star fort. This is a huge barricaded city and it looks pretty massive. Nothing to freak out about, I guess, but still very interesting. Um, you know, these buildings do look a little advanced for this time, but, you know, and look at the canals, everything that's kind of going through the city, but, you know, nothing too suspicious. And here's a depiction of Cairo. So, looks massive, you see the Nile, and what I find really interesting is all these pyramids, because there are many different 
kind of engravings and old depictions of Egypt that have all these extra pyramids that we don't really know about today or were they just adding those for artistic you know aesthetic or whatever or whether these monuments actually here and they don't longer they no longer exist it really makes you question like why would artists even depict the pyramids this way um autodidactic was mentioning that a lot of these pyramids kind of have an ethiopian type they're more vertical um shape so you know what's going on here were there more of these types of pyramids in cairo and they were taken down they were removed somehow um and what's this head what's that all about um here's the sphinx and so you know this could just be artist artistic representation but still why are they drawing domes you know why are they drawing skyscrapers in the back this doesn't make sense they you know they shouldn't have this type of these type of buildings during this time and definitely not in Egypt. It's also interesting that this book depicts the Toro, which is a one of the most powerful psychedelic plants that is said in many shamanic traditions to unlock the human potential and to um, contribute to altered states of consciousness. And maybe the society that was here at this time took use of this plant in many of their magical rituals and ceremonies. So just kind of weird that they're depicting it here. There's also many depictions of tropical type landscapes. And if this is from 400 years ago, that's also, this is supposed to be desert. So there's a lot of trees, plants, and weird creatures. Um, and here's Morocco, another depiction of Morocco. Big cities, different book. And still there's these skyscrapers and big towers that don't really, they shouldn't be there. Um, so why are there multiple books showing the same thing? And here's another book that talks about Malta and depicts it again with stuff that doesn't, or really shouldn't be there. So let's see if we can zoom in. Okay, so if you zoom in, you can see that there's actually these cities that are entire star forts. And there's multiple of them. So, again, another book, completely different. Another map depicting basically castles, different cities in Africa. But specifically, star fort cities. It's taken a sec to load, so I might have to make some cuts, but... Here's a, the next page, and we see some Phoenician heraldry and a massive star fort city. So, and this guy has a box. Looks like they're bringing something to Malta. So, and what I, and it's very interesting because the next page, it's as if they're like trying to extract some kind of old ruins or so this depiction is what seems to be an underground temple or huge architecture but they're underground and they're trying to extract what's in here let's see if we can zoom so first of all i mean this entire place looks kind of in ruins i mean it's, it's been damaged and you can see there's sun coming through here so they're trying to either use this or it's like they're repurposing this area to maybe survive looks like there's some fires going on maybe they you know they're burning things they're trying to get rid of stuff but overall it does not look like the people who are here right these people have come and maybe these guys are the survivors it does not look like these people are the ones who built this so who built it well it's the same thing with all these books it doesn't seem like the christians or the catholics who are coming to convert these people built any of this stuff it was already there and that the people who were here according to these books were cannibals or 
you know, very primitive savages. So is there something else going on that we're not told about? Maybe they're hiding? Why are there horses down here? Hmm. And here we have another old book that's about the Portuguese in Africa or exploring the new world. This is supposed to be depicting Portuguese settlements in Africa. Um, but I don't know about that. Again, we have the same common theme here where there's architectures and buildings that just do not belong to this narrative. Star forts and huge castles on mountains is what it looks like here. You'll see a lot of this where you'll have this heraldry, this Phoenician symbols, where they're really just trying to take credit or rewrite our history with these books. Um, but it's funny, it's, it's as if like when they were making these, they weren't too worried about hiding the fact that all these buildings existed. It's not till in the modern day that they try to wipe all this history away. And, you know, we have no idea that just 300, 400 years ago, there was massive cities in Africa that were basically medieval looking. We don't know about that. That's not in history. So it really begs the question why these Phoenician or whoever wrote these books, why did they allow this information, which kind of shows a past civilization, why did they allow it to remain? Well, they just took credit for it. That's basically what they did. They just, they just said, well, we did it. We made it. These are our cities. So, you know, this is all about discovering the new world, creating the new world. So this is the new world order. So it seems that from the old text and the old manuscripts that depicted Africa from just 500 years ago, that there's something else going on when it comes to the history of Africa. Egyptologists in the modern day are just being gatekeepers and have no intention on discovering new facts about the history of the ancients. Another common misunderstanding is this idea that the Phoenicians came after Egypt, when really, it's the other way around. Now first there needs to be a distinguishment between the early Phoenicians and the later Phoenicians. The early Phoenicians came from Atlantis, they were multicultural, and they brought the knowledge of civilization. The later Phoenicians were mostly white Catholic Jesuits who decided to conquer the world and rewrite history. This is why the history of the Phoenicians can be extremely confusing. Quote, it's likely that the city of Avaris was first settled in ancient times by the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians had settled at Thebes from the earliest times, and since we understand that the Phoenicians to be the Aryans, as well as sun worshippers, we are most receptive to the suggestion that they were the pre-dynastic founders of Avaris and other Egyptian cities. Quote, the Phoenicians, or more correctly the Kabari, were one of the greatest maritime races in the history of the world. They were the masters of the oceans and the world's most proficient architects, shipwrights, woodworkers, traders, and astronomers. There was not a civilization in ancient Europe and Asia that did not owe their existence to the influence of the Phoenicians. This was especially the case with the Egyptians. The civilizations of pre-dynastic Egypt were founded by these mysterious people of unknown origin. The first dynasty of Egypt was made up of Phoenician kings, and the language of the two countries are strikingly similar. The language of the Phoenicians was not, as most scholars want to believe and advocate, a dialect of Egyptian. On the contrary, the Egyptian language was derived from Phoenician. They want you to believe that it's the other way around, that the Egyptians came first, but this was not their main script. This was but an esoteric society that had developed magical symbols based on an already existing script in order to communicate to the soul through more spiritual symbols. The reason that this video focuses on Egypt is that many blacks in America seem to think that they have some connection with this land. Maybe so. But I think if one was to look into the research, the conclusion is that the majority of blacks are not from this land. This is not the homeland of the Moorish peoples. I cover this in other videos where we talk about Lemuria and the legend of Calafia. On the last secret black history video, there were many comments that I would consider black supremacist in nature. And there's this ideology that claims that they're the original humans and that the white man is but a parasite that came into this world through some type of genetic mutation. They go on to think that their ancestry comes from Egypt. The most common evidence that's presented is within the name, they'll say, Kemet, the black land. 
But that doesn't mean the land of black people. It means the land of black magic, but Wiki says it's because of the soil was dark and fertile. I'm not really sure why these black supremacists believe they came from Egypt as this is contradictory because this history of the out of Africa theory is directly tied to evolution which was created by the white man. This whole concept of the white man being the bad guy needs to be done with if we ever want to find unity. The true parasites are the cabal, the new catholic church rulers that took over Tartaria in the last reset. These are the individuals keeping our ancient ancestry from all of us. All humans are being suppressed in their ancient ancestry and we need to work together to be able to discover that knowledge. Quote, We confine ourselves to a singular point and adamantly proclaim an Aryan to be a member of any race. Honor can be found in men from any race or tribe, and so can spiritual maturity. The Aryan, who is spiritually and technically advanced, automatically benefits and civilizes the world he inhabits. No amount of ordinary men can achieve what he achieves. Furthermore, an Aryan can be a Jew or a Gentile. Saxon or Hindu, Celt or Egyptian, Oriental or Nordic, Maya or Mori. Originally, Aryans were the technically and spiritually endowed seers, sages, and elders of Atlantis, Lemuria, and other lost civilizations that flourished and then fell over tens of thousands of years ago. In this sense, the word Aryan is interchangeable with Druid. The lands of Egypt were multicultural. Let's look at what Plato has to say about Egypt. Okay, so in Plato's Timaeus, Solon goes to a city near Egypt, basically to ask a bunch of people about antiquity, and none of the Hellenes, who are white Greeks, had any knowledge that Solon didn't already know about antiquity. A priest, who in the story appears to be of a darker complexion, overhears Solon and basically tells him that the Hellenes don't have a clue about antiquity. It's very interesting though, if you listen to what he talks about when it comes to the common goddess and a common founder. Quote, as for those genealogies of yours which you just now recounted to us, Solon, they are no better than tales of children. In the first place, you remember a single deluge only, but there were many previous ones. In the next place, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noble race of man which ever lived, and that you and your whole city are descended from a small seed or remnant of them which survived. And this was unknown to you because for many generations, the survivors of that destruction died, leaving no written word. The priest continues and listen to this part closely. Solon, said the priest, both for your own sake and for that of your own city, and above all for the sake of the goddess who is the common patron and parent and educator of both our cities. She founded your city a thousand years before ours, receiving from the earth and Hephaestus the seed of your race and afterwards she founded ours, of which the constitution is recorded in our sacred registers to be 8,000 years old. According to Donnelly, the Egyptians were a colony from Atlantis after the Deluge. 1. They claimed descent from the twelve great gods which must have meant the twelve gods of Atlantis, to wit Poseidon and Clato and their ten sons. 2. According to the traditions of the Phoenicians, the Egyptians derived their civilization from them, and as the Egyptians far antedated the rise of the Phoenician nations proper, this must have meant that Egypt derived its civilization from the same country to which the Phoenicians owed their own origin. The Phoenician legends show that Miser, from whom the Egyptians were descended, was the child of the Phoenician gods Amnus and Magus. Miser gave birth to Tuat, the god of letters, the inventor of the alphabet, and Tuat became Thoth, the god of history of the Egyptians. Saint Caniathan tells us that Kronos, king of Atlantis, visited the south and gave all Egypt to the god Tuat, that it might be his kingdom. Miser is probably the king Mester named by Plato. 3. According to the Bible, the Egyptians were descendants of Ham who was one of the three sons of Noah who escaped the deluge to wit the destruction of Atlantis. 4. The fact that the Egyptians claimed to be red men. 5. The religion of Egypt was preeminently sun worship and Ra was the sun god of Egypt, Rama the son of the Hindus, Rana a god of the Toltecs, the great festival of the sun of the Peruvians, and Rayam a god of Yemen. 10. There's no evidence that the civilization of Egypt was developed in Egypt itself. It must have been transported there from some other country to use the words of a recent writer in Blackwood. Quote, Till lately, it was believed that the use of papyrus for writing was introduced about the time of Alexander the Great. Then Lepsius found the hieroglyphic sign of the papyrus roll on monuments of the 12th dynasty, afterwards to be found the same sign on monuments of the 4th dynasty, which is getting back pretty close to Means, the proto-monarch, and indeed, little doubt is entertained that the art of writing of papyrus was understood as early as the days of Means himself. 
The fruits of investigation in this, as many other subjects, are truly most marvelous. Instead of exhibiting the rise and progress of any branches of knowledge, they tend to prove that nothing had any rise or progress, but that everything is referable to the very earliest dates. The experience of the Egyptologist must teach him to reverse the observation of Topsy and to suspect that nothing growed, but that as soon as men were planted on the banks of the Nile, they were already the cleverest men that ever lived, endowed with more knowledge and more power than their successors for centuries and centuries could attain to. Their system of writing also is to have found to have been complete from the very first day. Donnelly goes on to show that there are headdresses from Native America that are very similar to the Egyptian headdresses that we find. Even the obelisk of Egypt have their counterpart in America. Quoting from Molina, History of Chile, Macala writes, Between the hills of Mendoza and La Punta is a pillar of stone 150 feet high and 12 feet in diameter. The columns of Copan stand detached and solitary. So do the obelisk of Egypt. Both are square and four-sided and covered with sculpture. In a letter by Jamard, quoted by Delafield, we read, quote, I have recognized in your memoir on the division of time between the Mexican nations compared with those of Asia, some very striking analogies between the Toltec characters and institutions observed on the banks of the Nile. Among these analogies, there is one which is worthy of attention. It is the use of the vague year of 365 days, composed of equal months and of five complementary days, equally employed at Thebes and Mexico, a distance of 3,000 leagues, in reality, the intercalation of the Mexicans being 13 days on each cycle of 52 years comes to the same thing as that of the Julian calendar, which is one day in four years, and consequently supposes the duration of the year to be 365 days, six hours. Now such was the length of the year among the Egyptians. They intercalated an entire year of 375 days every 1,460 years. The fact of the intercalation by the Mexicans of 13 days every cycle, that is, the use of a year or 365 days in a quarter, is a proof that it was borrowed from the Egyptians or that they had a common origin. So if the Egyptians were the Toltecs, as many older historians mentioned, then were there Moors, were there whites? Absolutely, there was white royalty, black royalty, this was a mixed culture, and as the Egyptian priest mentions in Timaeus, they all had a common genealogy they came from Atlantis. So where do black people come from? Check out our other secret black history videos if you haven't seen them. From our research, blacks and Asians used to be a single race and come from Mu or Lemuria. This is the Pacific Ring of Fire. The first blacks were not the humanoid form that we know today. The statues of Easter Island are supposed to be representations of this early humanoid form. The early black Mongolian races were a very psychically powerful race. They mastered clairvoyance and had abilities that other races did not possess. This is before Atlantis, and is still a very spiritually premature age. Very chaotic. After many ages, this land broke apart. Lemuria sank, and the remnants are the islands around the Pacific. California is one of these many islands. During Atlantis, plaques migrated to many different lands. They moved to Mexico, Northeast America, and this is during the age of Atlantis. Now, Blacks weren't the only ones in America at this point. We had the Toltecs, the early Phoenicians, otherwise known as the Celts, the Mongolians, and a couple other races as well. During the age of Atlantis, blacks were the first to start exploring the West and landed in Ireland as pirates. They are said to be one of the first to inhabit Ireland according to Donnelly's Atlantis. Now let me ask you this, how many blacks in America do you think have any idea that their history has something to do with Ireland? They have no clue. The majority of blacks think that their history has to do with Africa. From Donnelly's Atlantis, quote, The Fomorians were from Atlantis. They were called Formahraic, Fomaraic, Afraic, and Fomorag, which has been rendered into English as Fomorians. They possess ships, and the uniform representation is that they came, as the name Fomaraic Afraic indicated, from Africa. But in that day, Africa did not mean the continent of Africa, as we now understand it. Major Wilford, in the eighth volume of the Asiatic Researchers, have pointed out that Africa comes from Apar, Afar, Apara, and Aparika, terms used to signify the West, just as now we speak of the Asiatic world as the East. Well, therefore, when the Fomorians claimed to come from Africa, they simply meant that they came from the West, in other words, from Atlantis, for there was no other country except America west of them. They possessed Ireland from so early a period that by some of the historians they are spoken of as the aborigines of the country. We also have the legends of Calafia as we presented in other videos. 
This is known to be the official history on how California got its name. But why does no one question the legends of the Montalvo novels from the 1500s? It's because many of these mainstream historians in the modern day think they know it all, and there's no possible way that these legends could be based on truth. Maybe there's something more to this story that's not being told? From our research, it seems clear that after Atlantis and Tartaria began to rise, the Druids and the Moors were working together. Multiple races were, even the Toltecs and the Mongolians. This led to the creation of a new church, one that was founded upon higher spiritual philosophies and the passionate pursuit of developing the self. This explains the similarity between separated cultures around the world. There was a base system that was shared across all cultures. Being Aryan doesn't mean you're white, it just means you're a wise, noble man, regardless of race. Remember, this is about exploring identity crisis. You don't have to accept it, but we should be open to researching alternative concepts. We must continue to keep asking questions, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?